Well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Philippians chapter 1 as we continue our series of studies through this book that I've entitled Outrageous Joy. And as we work our way through this letter, as you know, we're focusing on the principles that can help us maintain an attitude of joy during difficult circumstances. And today we come to verses 12 through 18 where we find the fifth principle that helped the Apostle Paul maintain an attitude of joy in his life, and it is selflessness. Now, most likely you've heard of Isaac Newton and his famed encounter with a falling apple. When Newton discovered and introduced the laws of gravity in the 1600s, which revolutionized astronomical studies. But few know that if it weren't for Edmund Halley, the world might not have ever learned from Newton. It was Halley who challenged Newton to think through his original notions. Halley corrected Newton's mathematical errors and prepared geometric, uh, geometrical figures to support his discoveries. Halley coaxed the hesitant Newton to write his great work, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Halley edited and supervised the publication, and actually, he financed its printing even though Newton was wealthier and easily could have afforded the printing costs. Historians call it one of the most selfless examples in the annals of science. Newton began almost immediately to reap the rewards of prominence. Halley received, in return, very little credit. He did use the principles to predict the orbit and the return of the comet that would later bear his name, and you know it as Halley's Comet, but only after his death he received any acclaim. And because the comet only returns every 76 years, the notice is rather infrequent. Halley remained a devoted scientist who didn't care who received the credit as long as the cause was being advanced. And, as we, see, and we see, as we come to Philippians chapter 1, here in verses 12 through 18, we see the same desire in the heart of Paul here in these verses. Paul was willing both to accept and endure the things that happened to him and the things that people did to harm him in order that the gospel of Jesus Christ be proclaimed. But why? Why was Paul willing to endure all that? Because he had one love and one passion. Back in the 1990s, a young man by the name of Todd Graves also had one love and one passion. So he created a business plan, which ironically earned the lowest grade in his class at LSU. The professor said his plan would never work. Undaunted, the young entrepreneur put on a cheap suit, carried a briefcase adorned with brass combination locks, and presented his business plan to any banker that would see him. Each time, Gra Graves received the same negative response about his concept. Some bankers even told him he should give up the idea and go get a real job. <laughs> At that point, Graves knew he would need to raise his own capital to, to achieve his dream. The journey led Graves to work as a boiler maker in oil refineries. Graves eventually moved on to Alaska where he raised his own seed money in the risky trade of commercial salmon fishing. Upon returning to his hometown of Baton Rouge, Graves reconstructed an old building with his own hands into the first Raising Cane's restaurant. His one love, chicken fingers, and his one passion was his business. But as for the Apostle Paul, his one love wasn't chicken fingers. His one love was knowing Christ. His one passion was preaching Christ. 
In fact, as he says down in verse 21, if you look at it in chapter 1, he says, for to me, to live is Christ. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to turn with me briefly ahead two chapters to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And here in Philippians chapter 3, let's begin reading with verse 7. In verse 7, Paul writes and says, But what things were gained to me. Speaking of the things that he accomplished back in verses 5 and 6. He says, These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them rubbish, that I may gain Christ. And then he says, in verse 9, which actually is the essence of the gospel, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And then he says in verse 10, speaking of his one love, that I may know him. Whether it's the power of his resurrection, when he raptures the church and raises the church from the dead one day, or whether it's through physical death, through the fellowship of his sufferings, he says, being conformed to his death. If by any means... I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Paul says, here's my real passion. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. According to Paul himself, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17, the call of God in Christ for him was to preach the gospel. And that actually may be 1 Corinthians 7. I may have wrote that down wrong. 7 or 17. But he says the call of God for him was to preach the gospel. And that's why he was willing to accept and to endure the things that happened to him and the things that people did to harm him. So let's look at both of these a little more closely. In verses 12 through 14, we see Paul's selflessness in the things that happened to him. Verse 12. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happen to me... Now, this statement by Paul implies that the Philippians had concern that Paul's imprisonment would impede the progress of the preaching of the gospel. The things that happened to him... Yeah, you can read about those beginning actually all the way back in Acts chapter 20 through the rest of the book. And you'll see it ends up with him right here where he's writing this letter to the Philippians from Rome, in prison in Rome. But what Paul does is in this letter, he assures them that that's not the case, that his imprisonment has not impeded the progress of the gospel one bit And he he says that by saying, notice, that the things which happened to me have actually, check this out, have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. The word furtherance refers to an advancement or a forward movement in spite of obstacles. That's why some of your translations read advance or progress there. The Greek word is Prokope, which means to cut before. And it was used of an army of pioneer woodcutters cutting a road 
through an impenetrable forest, thus making it possible for the regular army behind them to advance into regions where otherwise it could not have gone. Paul assured the Philippians that his imprisonment had not only failed to impede his missionary work, but it had actually advanced it. And not only that, it had brought about an advance in areas where otherwise it would not have gone if Paul wouldn't have been put in prison, such as the palace of the Roman emperor. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, Paul writes and says, So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard. You see that? The words palace guard here refer to the Praetorian Guard, which was an elite group of about 10,000 soldiers who were members of the regiment assigned to guard many of the high-ranking officials in the Roman government. These soldiers were also responsible to guard pioneers who had... A, I'm sorry, prisoners, not pioneers. We'll talk about that later. These soldiers were responsible to guard prisoners who had appealed to Caesar, such as, you guessed it, Paul. Luke tells us in Acts 28, 16, Now, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners, that's including Paul, to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Paul lived in his own rented house, guarded by these soldiers, 24 hours a day. He lived for two years with a Roman soldier chained to his wrist. And every six hours, as the different soldiers would take their turn guarding Paul, guess what they would hear? Could you imagine this, being, guard, being chained to the apostle Paul for six hours? What did they hear? Well, here's what they heard. <laughs> they heard his testimony over and over and over. They heard his prayers they heard his conversations with the visitors he had coming and going, as well as they heard him dictate letters that he composed, such as the book of Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and of course, Philippians, all of which contained the gospel. <laughs> That's what they heard. In fact, what's interesting is if you figure this up, for two years, Paul had four different guards per day who were guarding him. Out of those 10,000 soldiers uh, that were part of the Praetorian Guard, Paul had an opportunity to witness to almost 3,000 of them. That's astounding, isn't it? See, Luke describes a typical day in the life of Paul's imprisonment this way in Acts 28, verses 30 and 31. It says, then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding. That was a typical day in the life of Paul there in the Roman prison preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching the things concerning Jesus Christ. And guess what? Every one of those guards who were chained to Paul heard every bit of it. The great English pastor, F.B. Meyer, imagined it this way. He said, and I quote, He said, at times, the hired room would be thronged with people to whom the apostles spoke words of life. And after they withdrew the sentry, that's the guard, or after they withdrew the sentry, the guard, would sit beside him, filled with many questions as to the meanings of the words which this strange prisoner spoke. At other times, when all had gone, and especially at night, soldier and apostle would be left to talk 
And in those dark, lonely hours, the apostle would tell soldier after soldier the story of his own proud career in early life, of his opposition to Christ, and his ultimate conversion, and would make it clear that he was there as a prisoner, not for a crime, not because he had raised a rebellion or a revolt, but because he believed that he whom the Roman soldiers had crucified under Pilate was the Son of God and the Savior of men. Wow, what an opportunity Paul had to share the gospel in a place that he never would have been able to share unless he'd been in prison. And not only that, Paul not only reached the guards with the gospel, but he adds, look at your Bible. He says, and to all the rest. You see that? And who's all the rest? What's well, speaking of others in the imperial household as well. That's why Paul wrote this in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 22. He said, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. <laughs> wow. So the gospel went all through Caesar's palace. That's not the one in Las Vegas. This was the one in Rome, okay? You didn't know there was one in Rome, did you? You didn't know they had an extension there or had a branch there. They, they did. And it's actually older than the one in Las Vegas. Anyway, I, I, I divulge, sorry. The gospel went all through Caesar's palace, a place where it would not have gone if Paul had not been a prisoner there. Paul's example teaches us to view every situation in which we find ourselves as an opportunity for spreading the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel today that in some area of your life that you feel like you're in prison? Is there some area in your life where you feel like you are chained and you just want to leave? You just want to be set free. You just want to forget it and go. Well, just remember, wherever the Lord has you, there is a reason He has you there. If you find yourself all alone, it may be very well because God wants you to seek Him and to get alone with Him, so He got you alone. You may be a mother, especially during these times we're living in now. You may be a mother who's at home all the time with the kids. And though you love your children dearly and would get trade nothing for them, you may feel like you're a little bit chained. Like, I'm never getting out of this house. I'm, I'm never getting any time to myself. And you may feel like, Lord, when are you going to set me free? <laughs> well, I would encourage you to remember John Wesley's mother, Susanna Wesley. Susanna Wesley had 19 children. 19. I think she pretty much caps everybody, at least at our church. 19 children. It was a lot of work and it was very difficult. But what's interesting is, out of those 19 children came two boys that she poured her life into, John and Charles. And between those two boys, John being an evangelist and a preacher and a teacher of the Word of God, and Charles being a hymn writer who has written thousands of hymns, those two men shook the British Isles with revival. It's amazing. So, again, we have to be careful when we look at our situation and think, I just want out of here. I feel chained. I feel like I'm in prison. Uh, you may feel like you're in prison to a sickness or a disability or to a sick bed or, or some place where you're just like, because of my physical situation, I, I can't do anything. I can't get out. I, can't, I feel chained. I feel in prison. Well, listen, Christian history is filled with people, filled with invalids, and especially a blind lady by the name of Fanny Crosby who felt so imprisoned and chained by her blindness that it wasn't even her fault. It was the fault of her doctors. But that woman wrote hundreds of beautiful hymns that we sing today in the church, such as a beautiful song that I've loved for years called 
blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Amazing. And we can go on and on. But here's the point. If for some reason the Lord has got you locked down, strapped down, he's, he's got you alone, He's got you what you feel like is a prison or in chains, listen, don't grumble and complain. Just ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want to produce through my life here? Who can I share the gospel with and what can I do? And He will use you right where you're at. That may be the very reason why you're in that situation. But I want you to notice... Paul goes on to say in verse 13, so that it has become evident that my chains are in Christ. Though Paul intended to go to Rome as a preacher, you remember how he came? He came as a prisoner. But Paul made it clear that he wasn't a prisoner of Rome. He was a prisoner of Christ. In fact, he labels himself that way in a few of the different... um, prison epistles that he wrote, Ephesians and Philemon. He calls himself a prisoner of Christ. And his chains, they weren't the chains of a criminal, but he looked at them as the chains of Christ. Those who came in contact with Paul quickly learned that Paul was in prison only because of his belief in Christ and his preaching of the gospel, not for being a criminal. But I want you to notice in verse 14, Because of Paul's imprisonment, the advancement of the gospel wasn't confined to the prison or the palace, but it was progressing in public. Look at verse 14. Look at your Bibles. Paul writes and says, And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul informs them that because of his incarceration, the preaching of the gospel was advancing throughout the whole city of Rome. What? How is that? Well, look, the word many here literally means most. See that? It literally means most, as as it is in my version in the New King James. It's many or most. In other words, most of the Christians in Rome who were panicked by persecution were now preaching as pioneers, moving the gospel forward through their culture. These believers were now reaching people in public, check this out, that Paul couldn't reach from in prison. Interesting, huh? The words, having become confident, come from a word which means to persuade. Here's what he's saying. The Christians or these particular Christians there in Rome, had been so persuaded by the brave and fearless example of Paul in prison that they became emboldened themselves to share the word of God in public. No doubt, they thought this. (laughs) Well, if Paul can preach in prison, well, then guess what? Surely I can preach in public. If God can use him in there... Well, then he can use us out here. Billy Graham once said this. He said, courage is contagious. When a brave person takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. (laughs) And that's true. Courage is contagious. What happened here was kind of like what happened on Omaha Beach, June 6, 1944, when regiments of men were pinned down in fear... Desperate for confidence, a brigadier general who could have sent written orders, get up and go, didn't. Instead, he took charge of the situation by roaming the beaches like a coach along the sidelines. His language was coarse, of course, but his courage was unmistakable. And as a result, he moved the beachhead uphill regardless of the opposition, regardless of the fear, turning a disaster into victory that day. And as for Paul and the Christians in Rome, victory? It was. During Paul's second imprisonment in Rome, just before his death, he wrote this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Listen. He said, Always remember that Jesus Christ, 
a descendant of King David, was raised from the dead. This good news I preach. He says, this is the gospel that I preach. And I preach this good news, or I'm sorry, and because I preach this good news, he says, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But then he says this, but the word of God cannot be chained. Isn't that awesome? So, because of his passion to proclaim the gospel, Paul was not only willing to accept and to endure the things that happened to him, but he was willing to accept and endure the things that people did to harm him as well. Now that believers all over Rome have been inspired by Paul to share the gospel openly again, not all are doing it with the same motivation, though. Look at verses 15 through 17. Paul writes and says, Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former, those who are preaching from envy and strife, he says, preach Christ from selfish ambition. He says, not sincerely. Supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter, those who are preaching from goodwill, he says, they're preaching out of Love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. (laughs) Notice, Paul mentions here two groups of people. Those who share the gospel for the wrong reasons, and then those who share the gospel for the right reasons. But regardless of their motivation, there's two important things that we must understand about them. Number one, they all were believers. These were all Christians. Look at verse 15 again. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. See the two groups there? Well, the word some in verse 15, describing both of these groups, is a reference to the brethren back in verse 14. In other words, both groups are confessing Christians, church-going folk. (laughs) See? These are not false prophets that Paul's dealing with here. These are not cult members. These are not even unsaved people. They are believers. And notice the first group, those who preach the gospel for wrong reasons, they do so not motivated like Paul out of their love for Jesus and others, but rather motivated out of their love for, guess who? Themselves. These are selfish saints. Very selfish saints. Now, is that even possible? I mean, those two words seem to be an oxymoron, don't they? I mean, totally diametrically opposed to one another. Saints and selfish? No, that's what they were. It's exactly what it says. Have you ever, I want you to think about this for a moment, have you ever read in the New Testament the book of 1 Corinthians? If you think it's hard to believe that there can be selfish saints, read the book of 1 Corinthians. Because there were some selfish saints. Some of them were divisive, litigious, sexually immoral, self-promoting, loveless, and the list goes on. But according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, they were still saints. He addresses them as saints. Sinful saints, but saints nonetheless. And that's why Paul had to write such a corrective letter to them as 1 Corinthians. Now, make no mistake about it, those that continue in their sin only prove that they're still sinners and actually not saints. As John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. They have the Holy Spirit. So they can't keep on sinning because they're children of God. 
Paul himself put it to the Corinthians this way. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. He says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? He's talking to Christians here. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to Christians. And he says, do not be deceived. See, that's why he says do not be deceived, because he's talking to believers. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, he goes on to say, or men, have, men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And that's not a complete list, but it gives you a pretty good idea. He says in verse 11, And that is what some of you were, past tense. He's saying if you're a believer, you should not be this anymore. He says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So if we as believers think we can just continue in sin... Listen, let me tell you on the authority of God's Word. Not only will we not have a part in God's kingdom, but what we actually do is we prove to others that we're still sinners and not saints at all. But even though as saints, our sins are forgiven, and now we sin less, we still are not sinless. See, as Christians, well, we sin less, but we're not sinless. And so this is how this first group of believers can do to Paul what they did. And number two, not only were they believers, but they were preaching the gospel. Look what Paul says there in verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ. Do you see that? So even though their motivation was wrong, their message was right. So... What was the motivation of these selfish saints? Well, Paul says in verse, verses 15 and 16, notice that it was envy, strife, and selfish ambition. Now, let's look at those for a moment. Another word for envy would simply be jealousy. They preached the gospel out of jealousy. Jealousy of who? Paul. They could have been jealous of Paul's position as an apostle. With that position as an apostle, he had apostolic authority. They could have been jealous of Paul's power to do miracles because the Lord did work miracles through Paul. They could have been jealous of Paul's pedigree, of which he gives to us in Philippians chapter 2. Or chapter 3, 2 or 3, yeah. But anyway... They could have been jealous of his pedigree as an educated rabbi. He was very educated. They could have been jealous of Paul's prophecies. Prophecies, yeah. Of his visions and his revelations that the Lord gave him. They could have been jealous of Paul's performance in his missionary endeavors. I mean, my goodness. Three missionary journeys where he preached the gospel, brought people to Christ, established churches. I mean, Paul was the epitome of that during his time. We really don't know what they particularly were jealous of when it came to Paul. But what we do know is that when that they were, okay, in the words of Nick Jonas, they were jealous. Now, I won't sing it for you. I don't know if I can even go that high or not. But anyway, they were. They were jealous, you know. But anyway... So I did it, didn't I? But now that Paul's ministry has seemingly come to a halt with him in prison, out of jealousy, they take advantage of Paul's predicament to promote themselves through the preaching of the gospel. What? Yes. They used the gospel as a platform to promote themselves. And that's what it means. They also preached out of strife. Now, the words envy and strife appear many times together in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 5, envy and strife are described as works of the flesh or actually works of our fallen nature, our sinful nature. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, envy and strife are signs of carnality, 
and spiritual immaturity. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 4, they are a symptom of pride. In James 3.16, they are labeled as evil works. And in Romans chapters 1 and 13, they are considered and they're named along with gross sins. Greek scholar A.T. Robertson wrote that envy and strife, that they are surely the lowest of motives for preaching Christ. I mean, can you think of a worse motive to preach Jesus to people than with envy and strife? Now, the word strife refers to contentious rivalry. Contentious rivalry. It reflects a spirit of antagonistic competitiveness. It's the person who sees everything as a competition that they must win. And so they're contentious. They're argumentative. They're always looking to get the edge up on everyone. That's what the word strife means. Earlier I referenced a great British pastor from years ago by the name of F.B. Meyer. And he was actually pastor of Christ's Church in London. At the same time... Two other well-known, iconic preachers were pastors in the same city. G. Campbell Morgan was the pastor of Westminster Chapel, and Charles H. Spurgeon was pastor of the Metropolitan Chapel. Both Morgan and Spurgeon often had much larger audiences in their church than Meyer did. And troubled by envy, Meyer confessed that it wasn't until he began praying for his colleagues did he finally have peace in his heart. Here's what he said. He said, when I began to pray for their success, the result was that God filled their churches so full that the overflow filled mine, and mine's been full ever since. (laughs) See, that's the antithesis of the person who is full of strife. See, this is when we feel that competition come up upon us, this is what we've got to do. We've got to start praying for others, not try to compete with them and, and dominate them. It's not of the Lord. The word strife also describes someone who cannot stand being surpassed and grudges others in their success and position. Hmm. Let me say that again. Strife also describes someone who cannot stand being surpassed and grudges others their success and position. That's a person of strife. A fisherman who filled a bucket with crabs to take to the market every day was asked a question. Hey, why don't you ever put a lid on top of your catch, on top of your bucket? Wouldn't the crabs climb out? And the fisherman replied, he said, I don't need to put a lid on, my, on the bucket. He said, as soon as one of those crabs starts to cl- climb out, the others reach up and pull him down. That's the person who's full of strife or who is a person of strife. And see, those people, in particularly that first group, those who were preaching Christ out of strife, not only wanted to promote themselves, But they also wanted to pull Paul down. And that leads us to their next motivation in verse 16. Look at verse 16. He says, The former, that's the first group who preached Christ out of envy and strife, the former preached Christ from selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. Or, if you have a King James Version, it actually says contention. Now, this word refers, are you ready for this? This is kind of timely. (laughs) This word refers to what a politician does at election time to garner votes. This is something we're all way familiar with. This word literally means to canvas for office. I mean, go to person to person and kiss babies and shake hands and, you know what I'm saying? 
And they do it in order to get people to support them. And like many politicians, the best way to do that is to put your competition down. You ever wonder why you see so many of these political ads? Where really the candidate is not telling you everything they can do. They're telling you everything their competition is doing wrong. And they just try to slander them and put them down in order to put themselves up. And that's what these brothers were doing here in Rome to Paul. It's crazy. These brothers were, uh, were using the preaching of the gospel to do this very thing, to put Paul down. They'd be preaching a certain text or, you know, sharing from the Bible, and all of a sudden that would remind them of something that Paul did wrong. You know, Paul's probably in prison because he doesn't have enough faith. Paul's probably in prison because, you know, like Job's friend said, he probably sinned. You know what I'm saying? They would use the Bible to convince people. Paul's in prison because it was his own fault. And they're using the Scriptures to put him down. Listen, always remember, the way selfish people build themselves up is simply by tearing others down. That's what they do. So beware. <laughs> As a pastor, I hate to say this, but I must, based on this scripture. Listen, Christian, beware when other so-called Christians come to you and they just start tearing other believers down because it's a sign that they're just trying to put themselves forward. But as Benjamin Franklin once said, a man wrapped up in himself makes a very small bundle. And that's what these guys were. They were little time. See, Paul's aim was to glorify Christ to get people to follow Jesus. But these men, their aim was to promote themselves to get people to follow them. And that's why Paul said, notice that they preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely. Do you see that in your Bible? Not sincerely. Meaning, they preached the gospel with impure or mixed motives. In other words, it's not just all about Jesus. But notice their purpose was not only to put Paul down, but it was also to keep him down making him by making him suffer even more. Paul says here in verse 16, look at your Bible. Supposing to add affliction to my chains. Do you see that? Listen, these brothers were not only jealous, contentious, and selfish, but man, they were malicious. Have you ever met a mean Christian? Or have you ever met a so-called nice Christian that later you find out they're very cruel and mean? This is the way these guys were. Listen, the word translated as affliction here is the Greek word philipsis. And it literally means to press together. And it's translated in other places in the New Testament this way. Tribulation, trouble, persecution, anguish, or affliction as it is here. This is what these brothers were trying to do to Paul they were trying to cause him tribulation, trouble, persecution, anguish, and affliction. It actually refers to irritation caused by rubbing an object over another. Basically, it was irritation caused by friction. Listen, think about it for a moment. Paul was already experiencing this in prison. Remember, he was shackled by the wrist to a guard... 24-7. Those shackles were steel, iron. I mean, they were metal. Those chains had rubbed his skin so much that his skin was raw and it was causing irritation to his arm. Not to mention, when he was in these chains, he couldn't go anywhere. He was stuck right there. And if that weren't bad enough, listen... He couldn't go anywhere without a guard, even where he was at. Listen, 
Imagine this. Two whole years. Paul couldn't go to the bathroom by himself. He couldn't go to eat a meal. He couldn't go off to himself by himself to pray. He couldn't go anywhere and do anything without that constant irritation of his chains and his guard. Now, these brothers that we're speaking that Paul's speaking of here, what they wanted to do is they wanted to add to Paul's already irritating situation. Like what Paul was enduring wasn't bad enough. They wanted to keep him down and make him suffer even more. See, these people, they weren't anti-Christ. They were anti-Paul. And they were using the gospel and the preaching of Christ to prove it. But, thank God, (laughs) there was another group of believers in Rome who were sharing the gospel for the right reasons. If you would, look back again at verse 15. Paul writes in verse 15 and says, And some, some of those who were preaching Christ, some also from goodwill, or as the New Living Translation puts it, with pure motives. And then down in verse 17, Paul tells us what those pure motives were. They were, there were two of them. Look what he says in verse 17. Paul writes, But the latter, this last group who's preaching the gospel out of pure motives, out of goodwill, it says, the latter, they were preaching out of love. You see that? They were preaching out of love. According to Paul, this is the greatest motivator, and without it, all our giftings and our efforts for the Lord, are actually of little use. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass or clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, that I could even remove mountains... But have not love? I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, (laughs) and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, he said, it profits me nothing. This second group of believers simply shared Christ because they loved Him and they loved others. See? That was their first motivation. Their second was this, that they loved Paul. Look at the rest of the verse. Paul says, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Do you see that? Now, the word appointed here was a military term used for a soldier on watch or on duty. It referred to one being appointed to a task. And even though the Roman soldiers saw Paul as a prisoner of Rome... You know how Paul saw himself? (laughs) Paul saw himself as a soldier of the Lord sent to Rome for the defense of the gospel. See? Paul's in prison, but he's saying, no, I'm actually on duty. See? Paul and those Christians who were inspired... uh, Paul, I'm sorry, Paul and those Christians who were inspired by him recognized that his imprisonment was not a disappointment, but it was actually a divine appointment. And that he was on duty right there in that prison in Rome to defend the gospel. And finally here in verse 18, we have Paul's conclusion on the whole matter. So what about all this is what Paul says here. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Paul says Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, I will rejoice. As Paul sat in prison and thought about those who persecuted him and those who supported him, his conclusion was, what then? Or literally, it could be translated, so what? So what? Listen, though he was persecuted by unbelievers and even picked on by some believers, he still rejoiced because Christ was preached 
and the gospel was being advanced. Wow. What a selfless servant of God Paul was. That is selfless, isn't it? Yeah. That was one of the reasons he could maintain an attitude of joy even in jail. See? Listen, the selfless Christian is the joyful Christian. He was even willing for others to speak ill of him if they would also, at the same time, speak well of Christ. Paul was good with it. Again, Paul was willing both to accept and endure the things that happened to him and the things that people did to harm him if it meant one thing, if it meant his passion, if it meant that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be proclaimed. But why? Why? Because Paul knew something very important, and it's this. The power of the gospel is in the message, not the messenger. Never, ever forget that. The power of the gospel is in the message, not the messenger. Remember, those who preached the gospel with wrong motives, in this case, they were still Christians. And guess what? They were still preaching Christ, according to Paul. And as long as they preached the right message, Paul overlooked their motives. And you may say, overlooked their motives? Is that right? Listen, Paul didn't overlook their motives because motives aren't important. That's a whole other Bible study. But Paul overlooked their motives because Paul's calling was not to defend himself, but to defend the gospel. And Paul's calling was not to judge the motives of others and of other messengers, but rather to judge the message. That's what Paul was called to. Now, if these guys had been preaching a false gospel, ha! Paul would have been on them like white on rice right now. He would have been judging them. He would have been calling them out, rebuking them, and setting them straight. But he didn't do that because this was a matter of motives, not a matter of the actual message they preached. And if you want to understand more of this, I'm not, we don't have time to go through it today, but Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. And 2 John, the small epistle of 2 John, only one chapter, 2 John in verses 7 through 11. Both Paul and John deal with this subject about those who call themselves Christians and they're actually preaching a false message and they talk about how to deal with them. Well, what's interesting is as we see Paul deal with these people, he leaves us a good example today. Because, guys, listen, me as a pastor, I run into this. Everything we talked about today, I've experienced and we've, we've run into this. You as a Christian are going to deal with this with other Christians. It's going to happen. And so we need to follow Paul's example. Listen, today as the body of Christ, we often make too much over what divides us and not enough other what over what unites us. Okay? Now I'm talking about other churches. Okay? And other Christians that we don't go to church with. In the body of Christ today, we make too much over what divides us, not enough over what unites us. I can tell you one thing. As I meet and pray, as I have been doing for some time now, with other pastors from different denominations... I actually find out this. These guys are my brothers. I actually find out we have more in common than what we have different. And many times as Christians, you know what? We're more known for what we're against than what we're actually for. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we toot our horn on everything we think is wrong so loud. I mean, on social media, petitions, I mean, if there's an injustice being done or a sin being committed, man, we're ready to... But why don't, why don't we have the same passion and zeal when it comes to telling people what we're for? 
Why, don't, why are we not so quick to share the gospel with people like we are in pointing out sin or standing up against sin? Listen, too much today in the body of Christ in this world, people know what we're against more than they know what we're for. It was President Calvin Coolidge. Speaking of being known for something, he was known for his brevity of speech. Of course, not like me, of course, but sorry. But he was known for his brevity of speech. He tried to use as few words as possible. And one Sunday after church, silent cow, as they called him, returned to the White House where his wife was confined with a cold. She didn't get to go to church that day, so she asked whether he enjoyed the sermon. Yes, Coolidge replied. What was the sermon about? The first lady asked him, trying to engage her husband in a conversation. I know none of you ladies know what that's about whatsoever. You've never experienced that. But this is what she was doing. And in trying to engage her husband in conversation, she asked him, what was the sermon about? Sin, the president replied. <laughs> but what did the minister say? Miss Coolidge persisted. And the president said, he was against it. <laughs> and see, this is like so many of us Christians. Too many times, that's, that's all others know about us as Christians is what we're against rather than what we're for. And one other thing before we close. Always remember that God is the one. God reserves the right to use people who actually disagree with you and disagree with me. Now, sometimes I don't like that. You know, but you know what? That's fine. If God wants to use them and they want to be wrong, that's okay. If God wants to do that, that's fine. That's a joke, okay? But God reserves the right to use any believer from any denomination, any persuasion, okay, that's, that's, that's doctrinally sound, that he wants to, even if they disagree with us. And we need to be okay with that. See, we need to be okay with that. And here's why we need to be okay with it. Because none of us get to heaven by being part of a certain church or a certain denomination, but rather by being part of the body of Christ through believing and trusting the good news of Christ's death and resurrection. That's how we become part of His church, the only church that really matters. That's the way we become a member. It's by turning from our sins, turning to Christ, and putting our faith in what Jesus did for us by dying for our sins and then raising from the dead. Paul told us in Romans 10 that if we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, guess what? We'll be saved. Yeah, but what if we don't agree on the rapture? They're still going to be saved. Yeah, but what if they don't agree with us on the things of the Holy Spirit? What if they, don't be what if they believe in speaking in tongues or they don't? Guess what? They shall be saved. <laughs> Pick your poison, you know what I'm saying? It's through faith in what Christ has done that we are saved and that we are part of his body and part of his church. Back in the late 1700s, being much concerned about the rise of denominations in the church, way back in the late 1700s, John Wesley tells of a dream that he had. In the dream, he was ushered to the gates of hell. And there he asked this question. Are there any Presbyterians here? And the answer was yes. Then he asked, Are there any Baptists? Any Episcopalians? And then John Wesley asked, Any Methodists? And the answer each time was yes. Much distressed, Wesley was then ushered to the gates of heaven. And there... He asked the same question. He asked, Are there any Presbyterians here? And the answer was no. 
How about Baptists, Episcopalians? You know, Wesley started the Methodist movement. You guys know that, right? That's why I'm cringing, right? Any Methodists here? And the answer was no. And to this, Wesley asked, Well, then who was inside? And then an answer came back, Only Christians. Only Christians. Wow. Now, do you remember from our lesson, or our lesson from our first study here in Philippians, our very first message, our first teaching, I gave you an acrostic using the word joy. You may have remembered that. I hope you do remember that. It's very easy. Joy. J-O-Y. Jesus, others, yourself. The first of Paul's principles, if you remember, that we learned in order to maintain an attitude of joy in this life was this. You remember this? It was realizing life isn't about us. It's not about us. Let me say this too. Life also isn't about Calvary Chapel. Life is about Jesus Christ and the gospel, period. And so guys, listen. What we learn from Paul today in these verses is that the selfless Christian is the joyful Christian. And I think we also learn this too, that the selfless church is the joyful church.